Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's session to discuss the COVID-19 vaccine. My name is Mark Munier and I lead the municipal and labor teams here at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Today we have members from throughout our organization and all business lines attending. And we know that members have questions regarding the vaccine as we see new information daily regarding getting vaccinated. Before we get started, a few logistics, and I'm gonna deliberately talk a little bit slow because we're expecting thousands of people and it takes a little while for people to be able to join uh, the session when there's that many people logging in. But before we do get started, just a few logistics. Today's session is gonna be recorded. A number of people asked in the questions before um, the meeting whether we would be recording the session and we are. And a link to that recording and copies of the slides will be distributed to you later this week to the email address that you provided when you registered for the program today. So there's no need for you to try to write down what you see on the slides. All lines during the webinar are muted, but we've left significant time for questions following the presentation. We've also received, as I indicated, number, a number of questions in advance, and we'll work to answer as many of them as time allows. If you wish to ask an, an additional question, and I see that a couple of people already have, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, and you can click on that Q&A button and ask a question to us real time. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible as well. Today's speakers, um, Justine, if you can just go through to the next slide. Thank you. Um, today's speakers will be Dr. Catherine Dallow, who is a medical director and vice president of clinical programs and strategy at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Desiree Ortenti, who is a senior director of our medical policy. Uh, Deirdre Savage is a vice president of government and regulatory affairs. And finally, Alana Margulies is the Senior Director of State Government and Regulatory Affairs. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dallow. Thank you, Mark. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for attending. I hope we're able to answer many of your questions. Um, we do appreciate you sending the questions in advance. It really helps us know what to address more specifically, and we're happy to talk about um, anything else that comes to your mind as we uh, wrap up our discussion. We'll be presenting for about 30 minutes, and then we'd like to leave the bulk of the time for further uh, Q&A as, um, as we need. Um, it really means a lot to us that, that you trust us uh, as your insurer to give you the most up-to-date information and be of service to you. Um, we don't take these presentations lightly. So I just wanna go through a little bit what the um, outline of the talk will be. First, you will have a presentation by Desiree Otenti on the science of the vaccine. A little bit of a biology lesson. Um, I promise it's, it's not too difficult. Um, Desiree does a wonderful job going through the biology of COVID and in the vaccine development area and how the vaccine works and also debunking some myths, um, making sure that we, we understand the facts versus the myths of the vaccine and the various forms of vaccine that are coming out. Then we're gonna switch over to our legal and uh, government regulatory affairs team. So that's where Deirdre Savage and Elena Margolis will talk about the federal and state government aspects of everything that we've been experiencing and um, what will be happening uh, in the future and how we at Blue Cross respond to uh, various mandates, whether they be federal, state, or information that the Centers for Disease Control or Health and Human Services or our own Department of Public Health um, uh, issue and our, our relationships there. We'll talk at the end about how Blue Cross is specifically supporting vaccine initiatives. Um, many things that we've been working on um, ever since the beginning of the pandemic and will continue to. And as I said, we'll then turn to uh, your questions, um, ones that haven't uh, been answered yet. And we're happy to entertain um, any of those conversations. Next slide, please. So first I am gonna uh, talk about a few common questions and give you some answers right off the bat. First, the vaccine or vaccines are safe. And I realize it's been confusing understanding the difference between um, full uh, FDA approval versus emergency use authorization. Desiree will get into those distinctions. 
but it is absolutely safe. Members will have no additional cost share or payment for the vaccine. It is free to you as Blue Cross members. The vaccine cannot physically cause COVID-19. It's actually impossible the way the vaccines are developed um, against this uh, virus. So Desiree will also explain how that's the case during her presentation, but we wanted to make sure you understood that at the outset. It is very common to experience mild side effects after receiving this vaccine. It really is actually very common to experience mild side effects after any vaccine. It actually is your body's natural response. And some side effects are actually a good thing. It means your body is producing the immune response we want it to do um, in order to provide immunity to your own system. Again, Desiree will explain how that works. For the vaccines that are current, currently out in production, a second dose is necessary. And we absolutely know and have every confidence that the State Department of Public Health Registry will track vaccination activity very, very carefully. Desiree has her own personal experience with this as a provider who's been fully vaccinated. Um, and I thank her for her continued service to patients um, through um, some of our charitable uh, institutions around, around the city, around the state. Once you're vaccinated, this is probably the most important thing to know. You must continue to wear a mask, continue social distancing and any of the typical hygiene and careful cleaning practices um, that we have come to know as normal uh, fare these days. Again, Desiree will explain, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, why getting the vaccine does not necessarily mean you are now protected like you're in a bubble. Um, we all have to do our part. The more people that get vaccinated, the less time we will all need to be masked and social distanced. I'm not. I'm going to pause here and let uh, Desiree take over with regard to the science. A lot of these questions will make more sense, and these answers will make more sense once she goes through her presentation. Thank you. Great. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay. And the next slide, please. All right, so before I talk about the vaccine itself, I have a few reminders that you might have heard before, but it never hurts to refresh. So first is the term SARS-CoV-2. It's the name of the virus itself, and it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. COVID-19 is the name of the disease caused by the virus, and it stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. SARS-CoV-2 is mainly spread in two ways droplets and aerosolized particles. Droplets are like rain. They shoot out of the mouth and nose when we cough and sneeze, but they're heavy and they fall straight to the ground. Aerosolized particles are like mist. They hang out in the air around you and they're very light. If I took a perfume bottle and sprayed a mist outside, you might smell it for a few seconds, but then the wind blows it away. If I sprayed perfume mist inside, it lingers in the air and you can smell it for a long time. And that's why the virus spreads much more easily inside people's homes. The air just recirculates. So for example, if I had gone to a New Year's Eve party and someone there had COVID, if I breathed in that misty viral air long enough, I would have enough virus in my body to start making me sick. If I took a COVID test that same day, my results would come back negative. Then for the next two or so days, without my knowing it, the virus will start replicating in my body. That's called the incubation period. And if I get symptoms, I might start feeling sick a few days later. And that's when I would be the most likely to test positive. COVID tests are the most accurate on the first day of symptoms. But what if I couldn't get a test right away? Every day that goes by decreases my likelihood of accurately testing positive. So by day five, I have a 50-50 chance. To recap, if you test too soon, you get a false negative. If you test too late, even if you have symptoms, you could still get a false negative. And that's why testing alone, even with more tests, isn't going to get us out of this pandemic. And that's where the vaccines come in. Next slide, please. Now, I like to think of the immune system like an army. Different cells have different jobs to do, but they all work together to defend the army base, which is your body. There are cells in the immune system that work like scouts. They're on the lookout for invaders like viruses. When they identify an enemy, they signal the rest of the troops to come and attack. 
Just like any army, it's easier to fight a smaller number of enemies than a larger one. So the sooner the scouts find, signal, and attack, the better, because each of it goes by, the enemy gets larger. Scouts are usually pretty good at recognizing enemies they fought before, and that's why adults rarely get sick with the same viruses or bacteria they were exposed to when they were children, like hand, foot, and mouth disease or strep throat. But for most people, SARS-CoV-2 is something your immune army hasn't had to face before, so the attack response is slower and less robust. Vaccines are like special tactical training for the scouts and the rest of the army to more easily identify and kill enemy invaders before they can multiply. All you need for this training is one unique part of that virus that the scouts are going to be able to identify. It's like training on how to see through enemy camouflage. And you need enough of this one part for the rest of the army to take things seriously. You want everyone at their battle stations. Now you might remember when you were a kid or from bringing your own children to the pediatrician, you get a series of shots over many visits and these are called booster shots. And they work in the same way I just described, training the immune army. Sometimes you need more than one training session for the troops to be fully prepared. And just like any training, the more, you, the more practice you have, the better you get. If we talk more specifically about the vaccines that have EUA approval. Now, FDA approval is different than EUA approval, but it's the same folks looking at the same science. So FDA has certain level that you need to pass to get fully approved as a product. This EUA process allows things to get to the market faster through, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a less robust process, but um, one that isn't you know, the official FDA process, but you still have to have those same safety checks. You still have to have that same level of data and the same people who are looking at the science need to make sure that it's safe before it hits the market. So the um, vaccines that we have on the market right now have been EUA approved. The two vaccines being distributed for use today are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And both of these require booster shots a few weeks after the initial shot to finish up that training. Now, both of these vaccines are made up of five things, water, salt, sugar, lipids, and RNA. Lipids are the building blocks for fat. So the first four ingredients of this vaccine, water, salt, sugar, and fat, are pretty similar to the ingredients of a cookie. And it's all stuff we're used to putting in our bodies regularly. But what about the RNA? Well, every living cell in your body has RNA in it. You've probably heard about DNA before. It's the instruction manual for how to make all the stuff our cells need to do their jobs. RNA is just like taking out one page of the manual to make one thing. Like if I had an Ikea manual to make the desk I'm sitting at, I can't use those same instructions to make a bed or a sofa. The RNA in these vaccines are the instructions for how to make one protein of the coronavirus. That protein is what our immune system army uses to train against the rest of the virus. That one protein can't make you sick. When the training is over, all the leftover RNA and proteins just get broken down by our bodies and don't impact us. We know this about the RNA used in the vaccines because many drugs on the market today use RNA injected into the body to fight rare diseases. It's not a new scientific concept, it's just new as the basis for a vaccine. Now there's one more very important topic to cover and that's something called community immunity, or you might've heard it in the news or um, you know, on TV as herd immunity, and they mean the same thing. It's the number of immune people you need in a community to protect the people who aren't immune. So to understand this better, think of a forest fire. Any tree in the path of this fire is going to burn. And in this analogy, the fire is COVID and we are the trees. But when we get the vaccine, we turn into giant boulders unable to burn. But one boulder in a forest isn't going to stop the fire. Now instead picture a wall of boulders standing tall, surrounding and protecting the remaining trees. When the fire reaches that wall, it'll die because there's nothing left to burn. But the problem is that unlike boulders and trees, people move around. So to stop this forest fire, we need as many boulders as possible, about three out of every four people. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here on this slide, you can see the vaccine pipeline is actually quite large and includes many different kinds of vaccines. At Blue Cross, we will continue to monitor this pipeline. Um, we'll look at the safety and efficacy of each vaccine as it gets approved, and we'll continue to update you. But now I'd like to answer some common questions I get about the vaccine and some of the questions that you all um, submitted to us in advance of this presentation. So the first one is, how can the vaccines be safe if they were made so quickly? So before now, the fastest vaccine ever developed was the mumps vaccine back in the 1960s. It was developed by one scientist working in one lab. He had no computers, no cell phones, no donkeys frappuccinos to get into the night, and RNA had barely been discovered at that point. It took him four years to develop the mumps vaccine. Now fast forward basically half a century into a global pandemic where hundreds of millions of dollars have been given to hundreds of scientists with a much more sophisticated tools and decades of increased scientific knowledge. We absolutely should be able to cut four years down to one safely by using concepts that are tried and true in other areas of medicine. And vaccines in general are one of the most well-studied medical products of all time. The first vaccine ever developed was in 1796. And on top of that, the concept of training our immune armies actually goes back even more centuries to when people would expose themselves to small doses of the smallpox virus through scratches in their skin. So we literally have centuries worth of data about how all these different types of vaccines work, how our bodies react to our immune armies being trained and the range that could, of what could go wrong if our bodies don't respond well to this training. So the, the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time, don't have any problems with their immune armies being trained with vaccines. We know they're safe. However, there is a small subgroup of people whose bodies respond to a vaccine with a trigger-happy immune system. These are the people who might have an anaphylactic reaction or other complications from the vaccine in general, or um, just regular vaccines, not even just like the COVID vaccine that we're talking about now. And it's because the immune army goes into overdrive, starts calling in too many troops or possibly targeting the body itself. And again, we can see that for any vaccine, not just the COVID vaccine, but that happens in a very small subgroup of people. And at this point, the new COVID vaccines have been given to over 94 million people around the world. I got that number last week, so it's probably even higher now. In the last report I could find, only 21 people in the United States had severe allergic reactions to the vaccine. For most of those cases, those were people with a known history of trigger-happy immune systems. It wasn't a surprise. Now compare those numbers to the number of people who die every day from COVID. Thousands. That's more than the equivalent of 9-11 happening every single day. That's not even accounting for the people who get sick and hospitalized or have long-term consequences from the virus. So if you need to compare the safety of the, uh, the vaccine and what we know today compared to what we know for the virus, if you had to take some kind of risk, it's much, much, much safer to do the vaccine and take that than face the potential Russian roulette of symptoms that you could get from the virus itself. The second question I get very frequently, um, so what's a variant and will the new vaccines help protect us from these variants? So basically a virus has one goal in life and that's to make as many copies of itself as possible, to replicate. It can only replicate in a host. Unfortunately with SARS-CoV-2, we are the hosts. So a virus sitting on my desk can't replicate, but a virus sitting in my lungs can. When a virus makes copies of itself, it uses our cells as the raw materials to do that. Now imagine for a moment that you had a picture and some tracing paper. If you were to trace a copy of the picture, it doesn't look exactly like the original. It's ever so slightly different. Now, if I were to take that tracing and make a tracing of the tracing, it's gonna look even more different than the original. The more copies I make, the more changes occur. It's the same thing with the RNA and the virus. As I said before, RNA is the instructions, the, the full viral RNA is the instructions for how to make the entire virus. 
So each time the RNA changes after it's making copies of itself, it changes the instruction manual. Sometimes it makes a weaker virus and those tend to die out. Um, but what we're seeing in the UK and in South Africa is a more contagious virus. So basically what's happened is the copy of the copy of the copy eventually made an instruction manual that became more effective. And that's another huge reason why it's not better to just get sick with COVID instead of getting the vaccine. The more people who get sick, the more changes occur to the viral RNA as it makes copies inside our bodies, and the more chances there will be for the variant to be more contagious, more deadly, and less likely to respond to vaccines in the future. So what about these variants that we know about and the vaccines that we have already? We need to think about vaccines in three ways. One, did they stop people from dying? Two, did they stop people from being sick enough to be in the hospital? And three, did they stop people from getting sick at all? So for all the vaccines that we either you know, have EUA approval for today or the ones that are coming up from AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, they've all been 100% effective in preventing COVID deaths. Not one single person has died from COVID after receiving the vaccine in the trials that we've seen so far. And that first question, in my opinion, is the most important one. They also prevented most people in the hospital from being sick. So that's also huge. People aren't dying after they get the vaccine and they're not being hospitalized at those same rates. But what you're seeing in, in studies today um, or you know, these numbers like 90% efficacy, 70% efficacy, that's that last question. How many people are being prevented from getting sick at all? Now, even though that's a very important question, it's not as important as the other two. And all of the vaccines right now, again, as I said, prevent people from dying and prevent the majority of hospitalizations. They're doing that for the variants that we're seeing out of the UK and South Africa right now too. So they haven't, these copies haven't changed enough that our immune armies don't have some kind of protection against them. But this again ties into how long the vaccines are expected to protect us. And we don't know yet how our immune armies remember their training. There are good clinical signs that they should be effective for a long time, but that a lot of that's gonna depend on how much the virus changes as it replicates. It might be a yearly shot like the flu, or it might not. Um, a few more questions that we got ahead of time. Is it safe to get the vaccine if you already had COVID? Yes, it's just army training. It won't cause a severe reaction. And yes, you still need a vaccine even if you got COVID. In the studies that they looked at different people, you know, the ones that were very sick with COVID versus ones that weren't, their immune training was all over the place. You have no idea how protected you're gonna be or not if you just get it and get sick. With the vaccine, we know that most people have enough, or actually everybody has enough of immune army training to prevent that um, very severe disease. But it's, it's hit or miss if you get sick with COVID instead. And the booster part, so the two shot um, for Moderna and Pfizer we know that that's gonna give more memory to the immune army. And when you get sick with a um, disease, we don't know if that's gonna happen or not. It could, but it's still you know, a guess. It's much safer to go with the known entity of what's gonna happen with the vaccine. Um, can I spread COVID if I got the vaccine? So there's a good chance you still could, but that needs to be studied more. So remember vaccines, they don't put a magic force field around you the virus is still going to get inside your body and try to replicate. The difference after the vaccine is that your immune army will target and kill the virus before there's enough of it to make you feel sick. But there still might be enough of it in your nose or upper airways or lungs to make someone else sick. So yes, until we reach that community immunity level where most people turn into boulders, you still have to distance and mask after getting the vaccine. And just finally, in closing, you know, I want to say that we've been dealing with so much uncertainty since March. And every day, more than ever before, we have to weigh the risks and benefits of the decisions we used to take for granted. Is it safe to go buy toilet paper? Is it safe to give grandma a hug? It, it weighs on us. And now we're being asked to do it again with the vaccine. 
But as someone who reviews science for a living, I felt comfortable getting the vaccine, as Catherine had alluded to, and I felt fine after my first dose. I'm getting my second dose at the end of this week, and I feel so much relief. Um, I felt so much relief after getting that first dose that finally there's a light at the end of this tunnel, but only if we work together to put out that fire. Uh, on to Deirdre. And next slide. Thanks. Thanks, Desiree. Uh, as somebody who works with Desiree and Catherine and Alana, um, I learn something every time. So I really hope um, as you're sitting there listening that if you have questions, be sure to ask them. Um, um, we have experts at the company and we're so pleased that you guys all joined us to lend what we can to your understanding and we can advance the slides here. What, I, what Alana and myself are going to talk about today is, is essentially how the government plays a role and has played a role over the course of the pandemic. Um, I'm going to focus on the state, um, on the federal, and Alana is going to talk about the state. Needless to say, you've already heard about the FDA process, which is obviously a federal government fu function. But keep in mind um, throughout the course from a public health perspective, as well as the effects on the economy, the feds have tried to shore up certain aspects of the, um, the response to the pandemic. The laws on this slide, like you see the CARES Act and the FFCRA, as well as one that just passed before the end of the year, were all intended in response to fighting the, the virus, as well as trying to, again, like I say, shore up the economy. So funds were appropriated for vaccine development. You saw loans for business, provider, specific industries, individuals. Um, this was that economic impact check that was um, sent out earlier. Um, and then also they established the rules of the road for coverage of testing, of treatment, and of course the vaccine for health plans and employers. And this also includes the Medicare population. As Catherine, Dr. Dallow already mentioned, Blue Cross is covering with no cost um, to our members at all, uh, the vaccine. While much of the activity referenced on the slide ha here happened in the early part of the pandemic from March to May, it took some time before agreement could be met on another piece of legislation. And just like I mentioned, just before 2020 came to a close, another package was passed to address, again, areas where testing wasn't occurring um, at the rate it needed, as well as putting some money into vaccines and things like education and infrastructure and other targeted areas. From the federal government, their role really when it comes to the vaccine itself is the size, the timing of the vaccine shipments. And from there, the states were it, to make determinations of those based on their own state populations and the people that they have in the state. So you can imagine, and I know many of you, while we're um, based in Massachusetts here, I know many of you are joining from places other than Massachusetts. So you, but you can keep in mind that Massachusetts is different than New York, is different than Florida is different than Nebraska. And the populations, whether it's density of populations, where, whether it's demographics, older populations, whether it's workforce differences, difference between farmers versus folks in manufacturing plants. These are all important aspects of, the, um, of what states would consider. The only, you know, the issue, unfortunately, with the prior administration, though, was that the vast majority of the decisions that the states had to make, they really had to get involved at a very early time. So this was like getting PPE and testing, for example. And there wasn't really a great centralized place, even for the vaccines, when those started to be developed and deployed. Um, that has led to some confusion. I know just judging from some of the questions are what are, um, uh, you know, why is it different in Massachusetts than New York than Florida? Some of that is just due to the rollout um, that the current administration is actually trying to look at now and centralize that process. Alana is going to speak to the rollout in Massachusetts, um, but 
you could you you know from your own experience whether you're in Massachusetts and looking at other states or you're in those states that you should look at what's going on in your state and the CDC actually has a website that you can link to to see how those differences play out for different states but like I said Alana will kind of walk through those phases of who can get vaccinated because we have seen some of those questions come in with the new administration, there has been a significant flurry of activity, and no pun intended for those in Massachusetts as we get our snowstorm. Um, in the few short weeks it's been in place, you probably have seen on the news the, uh, the COVID task force meeting, um, the White House press conferences, et cetera. Um, so they, they are refocusing their efforts, especially at the federal level, in the first place is to see where the vaccines are, to see if the vaccines have been used. They're going to be sending, uh, starting next week, I believe, 10 million more, 10 million vaccines per week out to the states. That's an increase of one and a half million um, per week of vaccines. Their intention is also to leverage um, the defense DARPA, what you might have heard. It's basically the federal way to use its own manufacturing capacity or to invest in manufacturing capacity to ensure the rollout of those things needed for vaccines. So while it may not be the vaccine itself, it could be um, the vials, the, the protective equipment, all of that that goes along with that. They're also going to be focused on um, continuing to test. You heard Desiree speak about the importance of testing. Um, so rolling out uh, and investing in cheaper and easier testing and keeping a real close eye on that supply chain is going to be very, very important. Right now, um, you should stay tuned um, over the next several weeks. The new administration has proposed a COVID, a, basically a comprehensive uh, COVID policy. And literally as we speak is having meetings at the White House with members of Congress to talk about ways to advance that bill. And again, that's not only for the vaccine efforts as we've been talking about today, but also for the economic impacts. Um, but I will uh, turn it to my colleague, Alana Margolis, to talk more about Massachusetts. And for those of you in Massachusetts today, you know it's a big day. We're in a new phase. Um, if not for that snow um, that has arrived, um, uh, we would be really underway today. So I will log on and on to Alana. Hi. Uh Thank you, Deirdre. I'm just uh, figuring out, there we go. Um, thank you so much for that. We can go on to the next slide. I think we'll start from there. Nobody wants to hear me talk too much about our regulators, I don't think, but we'll talk a little bit about the timeline. I think there are so many questions right now and they, many of them start with, when can I get a vaccine in my arm? When can my loved one, when can my mother, my grandmother? Uh, get a vaccine in their arm. And um, as you know, Desiree and Dr. Dallow said, um, that, that's great. <laughs> the more people who want it, the more people who can get it, the safer we all are. So as Deirdre mentioned, it, it is a little different in every state. And I know that uh, many of you are tuning in from different places across the country. So I will definitely try and be sensitive to that. Um, but we're here in Massachusetts and um, taking the cue from the federal government, from the CDC on general guidelines, uh, the Baker administration, Governor Baker and his command center have established a set of phases. And as Deirdre mentioned, today is the beginning of phase two. Phase one, all groups eligible in phase one can now get a vaccine. Uh, you continue to be eligible once you've hit your eligibility. It doesn't expire. Um, you continue to have priority. Phase one was very intentionally focused at forward-facing healthcare workers. Healthcare workers in Massachusetts were defined as uh, not just doctors and nurses and um, uh, direct clinicians. Rather, healthcare workers in Massachusetts were defined initially as any worker in a clinical setting or in any setting um, that was having direct contact in the care of COVID patients. So that included somebody bringing a food tray in a hospital or cleaning um, in a provider's office. So that was very intentional to deal with some of the health equity issues that weren't being addressed in other states where only the uh, licensed professionals were getting access. Uh, from there, first responders were vaccinated and again, continue to be eligible. 
Congregate care settings, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, were vaccinated through a federal pharmacy partnership. So CVS and Walgreens partnered with the federal government, um, got the vaccines, and then distributed them in long-term care facilities. Um, and home-based healthcare workers and healthcare workers doing non-facing COVID care. What was interesting is that we found in phase one, initially, there was a focus on hospitals and 98% of the vaccine was distributed to hospitals and large hospital networks in particular. And um, the more that they distributed the vaccine, the faster the phase went. And now our state was hoping to move on to phase two on February 1st, and indeed we did that. But what we saw is the flattening of phase one. So rather than have, as they had set out, phase one, group one, group two, group three, the end phases kind of merged together so that everybody in phase one then became eligible as the numbers got smaller. We don't know yet if we'll see that in phase two. What's important to note is that the phases are not set um, forever. Uh, they change as science changes, as data changes, as the federal government sends us more information, as we get more vaccine in, the phases are, are able to change. They're set out as a guideline and a standard for this moment. So I encourage everybody to continue to check whether you're in Massachusetts um, and you could check with uh, mass.gov slash COVID or COVID vaccine or check with the CDC and find out what your Department of Public Health and your state is doing for their phases. In phase two, we're currently in phase two, group one. That's individuals age 75 and older. This is a great example of the group that was not initially in phase two. And as things changed, they became the top of phase two. Um, as we move through phase two, we'll move from 75 plus to individuals 65 plus and those with two comorbidities. If you have questions about whether you have comorbidities, I encourage you to talk to your doctor, talk to your primary care physician, your nurse practitioner, whoever it may be. Um, and how do you prove that you have those two comorbidities when you go to get your vaccine? It's an honor system. There is an attestation form that you'll be asked to fill out that you qualify in that eligibility group. Um, from there, um, we'll move on to a lot of forward facing interactive frontline folks, early education, K through 12, transit, grocery, sanitation, public health workers. Now, again, I'll remind you, we saw around that phase in phase one, the flattening of the phase. So it may be that it's compressed um, and that starts to happen sooner. Um, individuals with one comorbidity are then the final stage of that, um, that grouping. And so time-wise of not only who can get it, but when can you get it? Today started 75 plus, we expect 65 plus around mid-February. And then the next phase sometime after that, and they've been more vague about that, which is what leads me to think that there may be a flattening, um, but we don't know for sure. That'll be later in February. So sometime to mid late February, we should expect that next group and early March for the last phase. After that, anybody who's eligible um, per the use authorization um, will be eligible to get that vaccine. We can move on to the next slide, please. So where can you get that vaccine is the next question. And there are a number of ways. Um, I want to put a caution here, regardless of what state you're in, please go to your Department of Public Health's website. Please go to your state's website and navigate from there. Please use the phone number that's been provided by your state government. It's crucial to do that, especially now when we're seeing fraud, um, in all sorts of areas of vaccine um, administration, changing websites by one letter, changing phone numbers by one digit. Make sure you're going through the proper channels because you don't wanna be giving your personal information out to anybody um, who should not be having it. So there are a number of sites where you can get um, access to vaccines in Massachusetts. And again, it's very much based on vaccine distribution. One way is mass vaccination sites. And you'll see this in other states as well, where large venues are being converted into vaccination sites. Two of the original ones and the most popular ones for New England sport fit, sports fans are Gillette Stadium and Fenway Park. Fenway Park just recently opened and Gillette's been operating for some time, starting with um, uh, first responders. We'll see all across the state uh, from Boston to Western Massachusetts, mass vaccination, vaccination sites. 
Um, we're starting to now see as uh, some of the vaccine is moved from some of the traditional sites or the initial hospital sites out into the public, we're seeing public vaccination sites. These will start to increase. You'll see more of those dots on our COVID uh, mm -hmm. vaccine site map um, every week. So that may mean CVS, Walgreens, may mean your supermarket pharmacy. Um, it could be other retail establishments. You'll also see restrict restricted sites, excuse me. Um, so for example, your local board of health or a, a region, a, con a senior center that is for just a set number of communities. So those may not be accessible to you, but they'll still be accessible to the folks in their area. So make sure to see what the site is and what the limitations are on that site. Um, there will be more announcements as we go on um, of the various sites where you can get it and how you can schedule. I do want to acknowledge for those of you who do live in Massachusetts, it has not been easy if you are in one of the eligibility groups um, to sign up. And um, the administration has certainly recognized that it's been a frustrating process. We expect to see in the next week or so the administration setting up a COVID hotline and there will be people staffed to help folks navigate. Um, what was a challenging, um, somewhat confusing map to navigate for anyone, um, I think became harder when um, the individuals ages 75 and older um, became eligible. So keep an eye out for more sites coming up. Keep an eye out for, um, you know, listen and, and look for updates when uh, additional appointments are being added. Jump on that website right away. Every, every week, twice a week, the state is ordering more vaccines and um, how many they can get out versus how many they can get in arms, how many they get into the state and get into arms will determine how much we're getting going forward. So um, definitely pay attention to this process and know when you think you're eligible and coming up and have a conversation with your healthcare provider. And uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. So again, if you're not in Massachusetts, even if you are in Massachusetts, you can use this site. Um, please visit a trusted source. I can't say that enough. There are so many places to give out information um, that is your personal private information. Only give it to the legitimate sites. Visit your Department of Public Health. Every Department of Public Health will have instructions for your eligibility phase, for locations where you can get a vaccine, and what information you should and should not be giving out in the process. And so with that, I know there are more questions in this area, but let's turn it over to um, Dr. Dallow to talk a little bit about what Blue Cross is doing and then we'll take some more questions. Great, uh, thank you, Alana. Um, I'm gonna be brief with this part, um, mostly because I wanna get to some of the questions that we've seen raised. I know some we have answered, but there's some themes emerging. Next slide, please. So um, these really are the fundamental aspects of how we have and will continue to support um, our members and the public at large. Um, this webinar is one of uh, many examples. We've been doing webinars, we've been doing public service announcement videos, we've been educating um, employer groups, we've been educating our own associates, we've been educating the public, we've been doing radio, print, um, anything to get correct and consistent information out to um, the public and our members in particular, and also make sure that um, we're doing everything we can to, to support the efforts of the CDC and departments of public health, as Alana and uh, Deidre uh, so eloquently stated. Again, communication about um, coverage. Um, there is no fee, whether it's for the vaccine or the administration that is covered by our plan, and you would have no out-of-pocket costs for that. Um, we also want to make sure that we are practicing what we preach. We um, are very much uh, encouraging our own associates to get vaccinated as they can. Um, we're making sure we're answering uh, any of those questions and debunking myths that exist. Again, I said we're supporting our state public health departments. We have ongoing communication um, with our local DPH, but also, um, as Alana stated, staying very close to what the CDC and other departments are doing in other parts of the country. Um, we are coordinating with our brothers and sister Blue Cross plans all across the country for that very reason and getting very close to what is happening in the other states so that we can best support our members all over the nation. Let's go to the next slide. 
So some additional resources, um, if you're still looking for more information after this webinar, we do have a coronavirus helpline um, and the number is there and the link from uh, my blue. We also have a resource page dedicated to all things COVID. We have a 24 seven nurse line. You can talk to a nurse anytime to get advice on where to get care or questions about symptoms. No additional cost. This is part of your plan at baseline. This is not specific to COVID, but they're very well aware of the questions that have been coming through um, and are fully prepared to help you make the best decision for yourself in conjunction with your own healthcare providers. Member services is always available. Um, and we have a public facing news, uh, news line site called Coverage, uh, which has many, many articles on several important health issues, but there've been a large series on, um, on, on COVID, all things COVID, testing, symptoms, um, equity, um, and we continue to publish those on a practically a weekly basis. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it back to Mark, um, who can um, help us navigate the questions and some of the themes. And I think we'll ask all of the presenters to come back on camera, please. Thank you, Dr. Dallow. Uh, the first question we had, I think goes to Alana Deirdre, um, but the, the question is, um, do I have to go to the same location to the first to get the second shot that I got the first shot at? So, sorry, did you want to? No, okay. why don't you go okay. ahead from Massachusetts? And I suspect it's similar elsewhere, as I know from New York and Florida and other things, but go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the easiest way is to schedule your next vaccine while you're um, waiting to see if you have any um, uh, adverse effects to the initial vaccine. You have 15 minutes to wait. Um, use that time to schedule your next vaccination. Um, you can get your second vaccination at a different location. You will get a card when you get vaccinated and it will tell you what vaccine you received, whether Moderna or Pfizer or one to be um, approved at a later date so that you can sign up somewhere else to get that second vaccine. Yeah, and I would just add that um, the experience for a lot of folks has been um, that when they are there, that's what those actual offices, you know, depending on the site is just making your second appointment while you're physically there. So they're kind of just getting you in line so that you're not going through the process, um, the online process um, that you went through necessarily the first time. Um, and it, just to note that the next vaccine is a single dose vaccine. So this is right now a Moderna Pfizer um, uh, question and which again, if you can get the Moderna and Pfizer, get the Moderna and Pfizer and go for the two um, because it'll be time to get through the FDA process and then get the other Johnson & Johnson out to state, so. Deirdre, that's a, that sort of leads us into the next question. And I guess this is to either Dr. Dallow or Desiree, which vaccine is better? Um, people are looking for some kind of comparison. Yeah, it's, um, and I welcome Desiree's comments after this. Um, it's a. It's an obvious question. Um, I, I think we all predicted there'd be that concern. Um, honestly, the vaccines are all functioning extremely well. And I, for one, am not gonna care which one I get. It's gonna be when my phase um, has, has arisen and where what vaccine the site that I'm going to for my appointment um, has at that time. It's um, it's natural to feel like um, you might want to wait, put in for a preference. The problem is, from a supply standpoint, um, it really will be completely impractical for people to guarantee when you book an appointment that they're going to have any particular form of the vaccine. The consistency among them um, and the fact that we get more and more people vaccinated is the key. The, the longer it takes for us to get people vaccinated, no matter which one they have, the longer we will be wearing masks. And this gets to that herd immunity concept that Desiree was asking was uh, was mentioning. And I know some people even say, "Oh, there's recent data, in fact, on uh, Johnson and Johnson that was published yesterday, concerns that it may not be quite as effective." Well, you also have to remember, one shot is going to be more effective than people getting the first dose of another vaccine and then not following up for their second shot. So it really, it's, um, we're not comparing apples and apples um, and the recommendation and what I will do is get whichever one's available when it's my turn. Yeah, so I'll just add on the things that are important to look at, again, those are 
the number of COVID-related deaths and severe hospitalizations, all of the vaccines perform the same. Where they differ is in people who have a mild level of illness. And I think of it this way, if I'm going into battle, um, there might I, I'm bringing in a shield. One shield might be bigger than another one, but any shield is better than no shield when you're going into battle. And right now we don't really have the options to choose. Maybe in the future we can, and maybe if you in particular in our later phase, that might be an option for you. Um, but the way that the studies were conducted, that question of mild disease, you actually can't really compare one vaccine to another because they were conducted at different times with different variants out there. Like um, Dr. Dallow said, it's not an apples to apples comparison. What you're comparing it to is no vaccine. Any vaccine is better than no vaccine. So the next two questions are kind of related. I think they are anyways, but if, if they're not, please separate them back out. But the first question is, what role does my primary care physician have in the vaccination process? And then we've received a series of questions about, can I get it if I'm pregnant, if I'm breastfeeding, if I'm on biologics, if I have other underlying conditions? Um, can you kind of walk yeah. through those? So I'll, I'll take the first one um, about, you know, how your primary care doctor may or may not be involved. And Desiree, I know, is an expert on the, on the second one. I can answer it. But um, I know it's a favorite of hers. So as far as individual primary care doctors, the, the answer is it depends. So you can imagine um, primary care providers that are in large institutions or large practices that might have the infrastructure um, to set up clinics, be able to distance people appropriately, um, have the scheduling capacity. Uh, many of those locally and nationally are um, establishing and have established their own vaccination um, you know, protocols, clinics. Some of them ask you to call. Some of them say, don't call us, we'll call you. We're going to prioritize people based on conditions. And again, Desiree, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and that really will depend on messaging from your own, um, your own practice and, and office. Where that is not as possible is the smaller the practices get or um, the further away from major um, bricks and mortar um, type facilities where these kinds of things can be accomplished. That, those are the providers where there's simply not the infrastructure. There may not even be the ability to store the vaccine and the doses that would be required to cover the practice safely. So those um, practices and providers might recommend that you go to one of the more publicly available sites like Gillette or Fenway. Um, even some of the larger institutions um, have a combination of giving um, you know, appointments for the general public as opposed to appointments for people that already have established care there. As we get further into phase two and phase three, um, I think more and more people will be um, will be handled in the mass vaccination type um, type you know or publicly available um, arenas. And I mean that literally and figuratively because um, warmer weather will come also, <laughs> so outdoor space can be used um, at those areas. But the volume of people that need to be seen at a particular office. Um, will outweigh the capacity at that point. Desiree, you want to talk about the, the other questions about comorbidities and also pregnancy? Sure. So in the studies from the different vaccines that we have so far, the participants, um, there was a range of people and ages and comorbidities, but for the most part, they were on the healthier side. Um, and so in general, with a clinical study, you can state things based on the people who are in the study. But then there's a gray zone outside of that where you can make logical clinical assumptions. So for example, um, pregnancy and breastfeeding, those people were not included in the study. So I can't tell you based on the science, yes or no. What I can tell you is that it's safe to get vaccinated in general when you're pregnant. Um, you know, we give boosters all the time to women who are pregnant. It's safe to get vaccines when you're breastfeeding. These particular vaccines haven't been studied in those populations, but clinically we can assume things based on what we know about other vaccines. But the most important thing that you can do is talk to your OB, OBGYN about it, talk to your primary care provider, and they're going to be the ones that say for you what the risk benefit ratio is going to be. And then you can make your decision on whether or not you want to 
basically risk getting COVID or you know, take the risks that might come with the vaccine, which again are very few. Um, comorbidities, for the most part, you wanna get vaccinated because those are what put you at risk of severe COVID or death. So most of them, most of the time you're safe. If you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, you know, those are things that are safe to get vaccines. Um, I saw some questions about, you know, if I just got the flu vaccine, can I get the COVID vaccine? You know, when I traveled to Africa, I got five, eight vaccines. I forget how many, it felt like 20 vaccines at the same time. Usually it's okay to layer these on top of each other. Um, same thing if you just had COVID. We have a 90 day wait period, but um, that, that's more of a, a grace period than anything else. Typically people have some immunity after they're sick um, for that period of time. But if, if, you know, the people that were in the studies, they didn't check to see if they'd had COVID before. They could have actively had it while they got their initial vaccine. And very likely there were people who did. Um, so we know that that's safe too. So because of the volume of, call, of questions that we have, just hoping that we can do a couple of rapid fire kind of Q and A. Um, so what one person asked if they'll need to get this shot annually, like the flu shot. We don't know yet. Simple answer, maybe, depends on the variants. <laughs> and what about children in the vaccine? When will we know more about that? So there are studies right now um, going on for 12 to 18. So we should have emergency use authorization, hopefully, for, for that age range, um, you know, sometime, maybe this summer. Um, younger than that, those um, studies aren't quite as, as um, ready for prime time yet. So, but the more adults and older children that get it, then the less vectors we have for the younger ones. How long after I get the vaccine does it become effective? So any um, vaccine typically takes about two weeks to see its maximum efficacy. With the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, you have you know that booster. Most people see the full efficacy actually about one or so weeks after the second booster. And the several questions about once I've been given the vaccine and gotten my second dose and friends have been given it, is it okay to let our guard down, unmask, gather again? What are the protocols? I can take that one. Uh, so again, you're not in a bubble. The virus still gets in your body after you have the vaccine and it's still gonna replicate inside your body before your body takes care of it. During that period of time, you can still infect other people. But let's say, you know, you had a vaccine, your husband had a vaccine and your, I don't know, neighbor had a vaccine and that neighbor came inside your house and you wanted to get together unmasked. If all three of you were vaccinated and didn't have any other contacts, like if you weren't next to somebody who was sick, um, then it's fine. If you know, if your neighbor is someone who didn't respond as well to the vaccine and you inadvertently exposed them to COVID, they could still get sick. So you, you know, there's still a risk there, but it's less likely that they're going to get hospitalized or die. So it doesn't take your risk from a hundred to zero. It, it takes it from I don't know a hundred to maybe. 20, but it's, it's still not nothing. Thanks. And then I think this will probably be our last question because somebody's asking to see one of the slides again. So if somebody's having surgery and extended hospitalization is going to be necessary, best to have the um, vaccine prior to hospitalization or post hospitalization, doctor. or is that something we're going to ask their doctor to comment on? Yeah, so it's we're going to ask you would ask your your doctor because it actually has very little to do with the fact you're being hospitalized. It has to do with what conditions you have um, independent of the hospitalization. The same the same criteria apply. And Justine, can you just bring up the slides again? Um, people were asking to see the slide. Um, from mass.gov um, forward slash vaccine. And that was what Alana was talking about. So if, if you wanna get more information on when you're eligible and where you can get the vaccine, that is your most reliable site in Massachusetts. It's mass.gov um, forward slash vaccine. And then um, the second website is of course the CDC website. So, um, I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, really wanna thank the panel um, for, and remind our audience that we have recorded this session and we'll be sending out the slides by the end of the week. 
As new information becomes available, we will hold further programs. So be on the lookout for additional opportunities in the future. Thanks again to our panelists and for all of you for attending. Have a great evening. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.